thirsting for God, thirsting for the living water. And he's about to blow through those doors. He's about to visit the churches in London. Those that are seeking, those that are thirsting. I believe that. And he's going to sweep through those places to those that are hungry and those that are thirsty. And he's going to quench the thirsting and the dry and harsh spirits that are there. He's even going to revive weary pastors. Pastors who have maybe given up or pastors and leaders who have said, I can't do it anymore. And God says, that's where I want you. That's exactly where I want you, that you can't do it, but I can do it through you. Hallelujah. So, Father, I just thank you, Lord, for today, that I can be a part of a work that you're possibly doing, Lord, and here in London. And I don't know what, you, what you've got planned, but, God, I just bless every church in London. I bless every church in London that is seeking you, crying out for you, God. And I thank you, Lord, that you are going to do a great move in their hearts and in their lives, Lord. I pray, Father, and open heaven above every church, Lord, that you would pour down the spirit of the living God and you would stir up complacency. You would stir up compromising hearts today, God, even as we pray and as we join together. Revive us again, God. Revive us again. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Bless your name. Hallelujah. Wow. Thank you, Lord. Way down. Well, that was awesome worship. They only, did you believe they only practiced one time? So I thought they did pretty good. Let's get ready. come into the full stature of who Christ is in them. And, yeah, this is a good one too, feels it? They don't know who they are in Christ. 
And you know, every time I have an opportunity to share, I say the same thing. You can come and want a church pew. You're not going to get any brownie points, you know, for how many times you go to church or how many times you go to meetings. But God wants you to be a, a mature Christian. He wants to do a work on the inside and in your heart, right? Because anybody can go to church, you know, and, and say they go to church. But meanwhile, they don't know God or they haven't known God in forever, you know? So, and again, go to church. I'm not telling you not to go to church. <laughs> Instead of this, what was wrong with the other one? I'm not sure. Can I take this off? <laughs> that doesn't matter. Um, I'm not used to it. I don't know why. <laughs> but anyway, um, so it's my heart and my passion. I tend to my messages that God lays in my heart. They're they're a little different, but they all have. Um, they they all seem to go down the same road. Okay, so for those of you who um, sat under me and have heard some of my teaching, you're going to probably hear some things again. But as I was preparing um, a message for today, I sensed the Holy Spirit leading me to read Josiah. Um, can this be turned on just by chance? Okay. <laughs> and I just felt the Lord was leading in my heart to say that in this hour and in this time, he's raising up a Josiah generation. Amen. And you know, we may have heard that down, you know, the road, you, you know, many of us as Christians that have been around for a long time have probably heard that. I know I have. But as I thought about it, and, and what God was saying to me for today in that, I thought, what does a Josiah generation look like? What might it be like in our time? And if, if you look at Josiah, now we're not going to go through all of it because this is just briefly, but you can find it in 2 Kings and I believe Chronicles. Um, just some of the things that Josiah did. He did what was right in the sight of God. He did not waver at all in his, in his serving God. He was a worshiper. He tore down idol worship and all the altars. And he got rid of the priests that taught the people. He was a man of restoration and he was a man of action. And in 2 Kings 23, I believe it is, it says, Neither before nor after Josiah was there a king like him who turned to the Lord as he did with all his heart, with all his soul, with all his strength, in accordance with all of the law of Moses. He rebuilt the temple. And that back then, when you think back then, it was uh, mortar and brick. God is rebuilding the temple of us made out of flesh. He is rebuilding the work of Christ in us. He wants to get us to a place of maturity. Amen? Amen? So God is raising up a people who will reverentially love and fear their God. That's what I believe. There's been a lot of complacency and compromise in the body of Christ. And he is doing a shaking. I believe that. I see it, and I believe it. They are a people, the jo Josiah generation will be a people who will long for uh, restoration, of the presence of God in their lives first and in the lives of the church. Amen? Yeah. It is a people who want to get back to their roots of their faith and what the Word says about them. Because yeah. really, it's so easy for us to get comfortable as saints, is it not? Mm -hmm. I mean, I've, I've been guilty of it. It's easy to just go to church and keep things, you know, just on an, on an, easy, on an easy level and not allow God to deal with it. But God is wanting us to get back to what this word says about us. Many defeated Christians walking around. So God is preparing the people to get a hold of truth and revelation about what this word says about them and for them. 1 Peter 2.5 says, You yourselves, like lively stones, are being built up as a spiritual house. To be a holy priesthood. Yes. To be a holy priesthood. You are a priesthood this morning. You are to be holy. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. To offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And you know, God has given us to the world. Mm -hmm. We are carriers yeah. of his light. We are carriers of his glory. He has given us to the world. But the problem is, is there's too much death in us. There's too much carnality in us for us to even, for even the world to see the Christ in us. And that's what God is changing. I believe it with all my heart. God is restoring his body. Paul himself said, don't you know you are God's temple? 
Hallelujah. And that his spirit dwells within you. Yes. He's in us. Isn't that exciting? Like sometimes we can get <laughs> we can we can be 30 years saved. I still get excited. I still lay on the floor, roll laughing, cry and shake. I still cry over him. I still get excited over God. He is raising up repairers in our day. That's what he's doing. Isaiah 58, 12 says, And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt raise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of paths to dwell in. The word breach means a break or a gap that has risen. It signifies an infraction of truth or a violation of truth. When we don't do what this word says, when we don't walk and live and move and have our being with what this word says about us, that is a violation of his word. Amen. The breach is a lack of fidelity to God's word. As there was a breach in Judah, there is one today in the modern church. In 2007, the Lord had given me a word, and um, I won't share it all, but he told me um, that he has built a wall around his people. And that there has been a breach in the wall. And that things have crept in to destroy the flock thereof. And God was calling me at that time that I am a repairer. And he said many repairers will come alongside of you and repair the breach. God is raising up repairers in our time. Is that you this morning? Is that you possibly that, that maybe you've got something the body needs? You know, to bring healing, to bring health and wholeness to somebody's soul and spirit. We have to embrace the word of truth. Glory to God. A spiritual repairer of breaches is one who restores the right way, beginning with himself. It always starts with us. Those who are called to be repairers are going to bring the truth of the word of God to people's lives. So therefore, Josiah generation will be pursuing a restoration of their own lives first. Tearing down stinking thinking, embracing this word of truth and not letting go of it, what it says for you. Getting a hold of idols that have been built up in your heart. Because I'll tell you, saints, there's a lot of us that have idols in our heart that God wants to tear down. And in order for him to use us out there, we've got to... We've got to shine forth with the glory. And, and there can be no mixture with God. There can be no mixture at all with God. So getting the idols that we have built up in our hearts, repenting, walking away from the things that have hindered the flow of God in our lives. Josiah knew this, his position, and he knew that he reigned. He did not waver or he did not compromise. We need to be a people who know that we are called to reign. This morning, every one of you are called to reign. Did you know that? Amen. We need to start positioning ourselves, mm -hmm. individually and corporately. If we want to see a move of God, mm -hmm. I mean, I, you know, I'm not saying I know anything, but I can go by from what I see, but there isn't a whole lot of prayer going on in people's lives and, and, and corporately. We need to get back to that. Get back on our knees and get back yeah. crying out and seeking God. You know, and it's not about works, but it's about um, uh, petitioning him. And it's about um, uh, getting into the heavens and saying, God, bring heaven on earth. Prepare that people. Seeking God, setting ourselves apart, saying, not, your, not our will, Lord, but yours. This morning I want to encourage you because that's what I do. I'm an exhorter and I'm a, I equip. I, that's, that's just the way God's been using me and I've come to see that. But I want to challenge you today to walk in what God has called you to walk in. I want to present to you, and I can only present to you in part what he's given me. What I know is truth, because there's no point in me getting up here if it's not working in my life. Amen. But I know it's working in my life, and what I share, I've experienced. Amen? Yeah. Amen. I, once heard, I once heard that if you can embrace the vessel, then you can embrace the message. So if you can embrace me this morning, don't look at my appearance, my, you know, my, um, I have my own vocabulary, as I'm told, I, I made up words that maybe I wasn't taught in school, but that's okay. Don't look at that, but look at the message of God. Look at what he's saying through me as the vessel. It's not about us anyway. So I do believe today hearts are going to be changed and lives are going to be healed. 
And that may be just with a drop of whatever God's word does in your heart this morning. And I know that because God reigns. Yes. He reigns in this place. Yes. He reigns in everyone's heart this morning. And you know, it doesn't matter what state the world is in. It doesn't matter what's going on in the political realm. It doesn't matter what's going on in your home, in your lives, in your marriage, in your family, in your finances. Why? Because God reigns in you. Yeah. He reigns on the hearts of each individual here. And he's greater. Yeah. He's greater than every circumstance. He's yeah. greater than any financial situation you're facing, any health issues. Yeah. Hallelujah. Amen. Many struggle with sin or the sin nature. Many do. And <coughs> not knowing, many not, not knowing what God's will is for their life or what purpose God has for them in their lives. Many don't know that they've been destined and designed to reign here and now. This, this message excites me because I, I can just honestly say the last probably <coughs> Maybe five years, I've just started walking in this. I may have been walking it, but not really understanding what it was. But God has just been opening this up to me. But anyway, many struggle with sin, with their sin nature. But I like what Song of Solomon says. It says in seven, chapter 7, verse 10, it says, I am my beloved's, and his desire is towards me. Yeah. You are his beloved. And his desire is towards you. So it don't matter what you're facing. It don't matter what you're feeling. His desire is towards you. Therefore, he's going to get you to where you're supposed to be. Amen? Some of the things we need to remember. One of the Philippians 1.6. Being confident. Being persuaded. Paul said, I'm fully persuaded of this very thing. That he which began a good work in you will perfect it. Will perform it. Will accomplish it. Until the day of Jesus Christ. So he will make sure that that work in you will get completed. Yeah. Because you are his. You are his. Amen? We need to come into that rest. Hallelujah. First Peter 1 Peter 1.4 says, We have become partakers of the divine nature. Of the divine nature of God. First Corinthians 6.17 says, We are one spirit with Christ. Romans 6 talks about that our old man is crucified with Christ. He that is dead is freed from sin. You can find all that in Romans 6. The reason people keep on sinning is because they, they need to renew their minds. They have a knowledge problem. That's all it is. If they get the word in them, it will renew their stinking thinking. And when they get that out of the way, then they start to realize who they are in Him. Amen? Amen. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You, you no longer live. You have been crucified with Christ. Too many people resurrect the old man. Too many people keep living in the old nature. But he's dead. The Bible says he's dead. We don't need to resurrect. We now have a new nature, a divine nature, dwelling within us. There's nothing greater than God reigning in our lives. And he will have a people. He will have a people who will declare it, who will live it, and walk in it. Amen? Psalm 96, 9 um, was the scripture the Lord gave me for this, this meeting. And um, it says in verse 9 and 10, we won't read it all, but all through that psalm, you will see a type of people. And they are the, this is the people of God. They are people that sing unto the Lord, who bless his name, who show forth his salvation, who declare his glory and wonders, who worship him. A people who say, God reigns. God reigns. A people where God is enthroned upon their hearts, and he is King of kings and Lord of lords. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Psalm 96. Starting in verse 9, worship the Lord in holy attire, tremble before him all the earth, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. That holy attire, I believe the holy attire is the beauty of holiness. It is the new man. We can't worship him in our carnal nature. We can't worship him in the old sin nature. He has given us a new man, and that is what we have to clothe ourselves with, amen? 
But the thing is, you know, it's not just about saying, well, God reigns. Anybody can say God reigns. You can go out on the street and they'll say, yeah, God reigns. He, he owns the universe and so forth. But the thing is, is you have to believe it. You have to know it and believe it. But when we say God reigns, we're saying that you are king of kings and lord of lords in, in my life. Yeah. You're giving him. You're surrendering all to him. Holding nothing back. Loving him with all your heart, with all your mind, and all your soul. Amen? Many in the body of Christ know him as Savior, but they don't know him as King. And Jesus said, as we know this scripture in Matthew 7, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter into the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father who is in heaven. And on that day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you depart from me. That word know there, it speaks of a, a place of intimacy. We have to know him intimately. We have to know him on a personal relationship. As I said earlier, not just going and warming a church pew, but communing with God, amen? We all need to surrender in our hearts all those things that we um, hold back from him. Amen. The word reign means to rule in the Greek. It means to be king or to be made king. So in some of the saints, he... He is king. There are many that, that walk around where he is king. But there are many saints that need to make him king. King over everything. Is allowing him to rule in our hearts. Amen. Allowing that new man. When that's working in our lives, then we can, we can make a declaration. And that declaration is, God, you reign over my circumstance. You reign over my health. You reign over my finances. And then you're believing it. Because you've, you've put it in your heart and you've walked it out then you can, you can confess it and watch the results come into your life. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. It doesn't matter what we feel, what we see, God reigns. Yeah. And that is really something to get excited about. But yeah. there's a lot of saints that don't know that. And that's where my burden is because, you know, what's the point of going all through Christianity if you don't know him? Yeah. Yeah. We need to get a revelation on who we are in Christ. You know, recently I just really came into a great revelation after 30-something years of serving God that he really wanted to heal my body. You know, I had battled some sicknesses, and uh, it was a long journey, but I'm not here to get into all of that. But, but when my eyes were opened to that, I mean, I read it many times, I confessed it, but when the, when the scales came off my eyes and I saw that God really, truly loved me and wanted to heal me, it set me free. Completely set me free. Many in the body of Christ have mindsets and strongholds. And we all know the scripture, at least we should, 2 Corinthians 10. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. So you are casting down thoughts that exalt themselves against what? The knowledge. The knowledge of what this word says. He says you're healed. Don't even entertain the fact that you're not. He says you're delivered. Don't even entertain the fact that you're not. Stand on the promises. If, if it means you've got to write them out, then write them out. Amen? You've got to stop letting the devil whisper in your ear that you're a nobody, that you're useless, you're not going to amount to anything. That you're just a, an old sinner, defeated by sin, because that's not true. We are saints. If you gave your life to Jesus, you are not a sinner. You are a saint. Glory to God. So instead, tell the devil and every high thing that exalts itself above the knowledge of this word to hit the highway. Yeah. That's what you got to do. Kick him right in the butt and say, devil, you don't have any right to my life. Those thoughts are not from God. But I choose to dwell on what's pure, what's right, and what's honest. Amen? Amen. Saints fail in their walks due to lack of knowing who they are. Hosea 4.6 says, My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. The word destroyed there means fail. So his people, I mean that's God saying that, his people fail in their walks for lack of knowledge. Knowledge is power. We've all heard that, right? The word knowledge means the knowing. The knowing what? The knowing what the word says about you. 
Hallelujah. Knowing who you are in Christ. Knowing what belongs to you. Because you reign. You reign here right now in this life. Amen? Don't get too excited. <laughs> I am, I'm excited because that's exciting. We reign right now. You know, that's awesome news. Yeah. Proverbs 12, 1 says, Those who love instruction love knowledge. But he who hates reproof is stupid. Those who love instruction. You know what? There was a time I didn't love instruction. I was too arrogant, too rebellious, and too prideful. But now, if, if somebody's got something to, to tell me, as long as you know we're in a relationship, and I, and I respect them and so forth, I'm open to reproof. Because I don't want to be labeled as stupid. We have to be teachable, amen? Amen. We have been brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light. We have been brought out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Yeah. He reigns in you. Matthew 5, 4 says, You are the light of the world, a city set on the hill that cannot be hid. How can that light shine if, if we don't know who we are? How can that light shine if we've got idols in our heart? How can that light shine if, if you know, we've got um, terrible thoughts going on in our head? We have to fill ourselves with the word. We are joint heirs with Christ. We are the head, not the tail. We are above and not beneath. Glory to God. You are a saint. You are forgiven. You are an overcomer. You are a child of a powerful kingdom. You live in a powerful kingdom. And your daddy is the king of kings. Amen. That's exciting. Amen. I remind him of that every day. Every day I wake up, I say, Lord, this is the day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And then I just add a bunch of other things to it. We've got to start taking a stand in what this word says about us. We are the people of God. That's something to be excited about. Yeah. There are many saints walking through life never obtaining their inheritance. Never. If you're born again this morning, then you belong to the family of God. That's what the scriptures tell us. You have become heirs to the greatest fortune ever. Think about that. Yeah. He's your daddy. He's the king of kings, and he owns the universe. Amen. And you are heir to that. In order to have an inheritance, someone has to die, correct? Yeah. Did he die? Yeah. And he rose again. Yeah. He didn't leave us coals. He left us a, a, a vast book of promises and, and treasures and things to live, live by. Amen? Yeah. So our inheritance, in a nutshell, is everything that word says for us and about us. And we have to enjoy it. If in the natural, if a relative left us something, would you not enjoy the inheritance? Well, what's so different about the spiritual? We need to start enjoying what he's given us. Hallelujah. We need to appropriate. That's the, that really is the key. You need to appropriate what the word says for you. There are many never walk, there are many never walking in what God has given them, what's already theirs. They don't even know. There's, I mean, I'm not saying I know the numbers, but I can imagine just by with people I have encountered in relationship that many people don't know what belongs to them. But God wants us to know today. They're struggling through life just trying to make Christianity work. But it's not a formula. It's not a fix. It's not something you try. It's a relationship. Yeah. It's a relationship with God, Abba Daddy. Amen? Yeah. And just like Song of Solomon said that his des desire is toward us, should not our desire and our love be towards him? Amen. Hallelujah. Paul said in Philippians that I may know him. That word also speaks of intimacy. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Why the power of his resurrection? Because that resurrection power lives in you. That same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. And it will quicken your mortal body. Hallelujah. The fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Jesus is longing for the church to know him and for the church to know who they are in him. What does it mean for us to reign here? What, what does that look like? What does that mean? First of all, we can't reign until we understand who we are. And that's why so many Christians walk around defeated. That's, so, that's why so many Christians struggle with the sin nature. Because they don't know what the word says about them. In 1 John 4, it says, as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Think about that. I mean, that in a nutshell, 
you know, we could just close right there and just say, that says it all. As he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Revelation 1, 5, 6, uh, 6, sorry, tells us, to him who loves us and has, oh, sorry, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings on earth. The ruler of kings on earth. To him who loves us, has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests. Yes. To his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever yes. and ever. Amen. Go to Revelation 5.10. Five ten says, "You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to our God, and they will reign upon the earth." Where are they going to reign? On earth. On earth. On earth. Amen. We're not here just passing time, you know, and dealing with suffering and oh, and I got to go through this and deal with that. No, you're here to reign through your suffering, through your problems, yes. And, yes. and rise above it and be the be the uh, the saint that God has called you to be. Amen. I like the Amplified Version. It says, and you have made them a kingdom, a royal race, yes. and priests to our God, and they shall reign as kings. Yes. Did you know you're here to rule as kings? Yes. And the king of kings is over you. <coughs> Hallelujah. Where? Okay, go to Romans 5.17. Uh, says, for if by the transgression of the one, death reigned through the one, which is Adam, much more those who receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Waymouth translation is, for if by the trespass of the one, death reigned as king through one, much more shall they who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness reign as kings in the realm of life. Yes. We are to reign here and now. Yes. The very thought of reigning carries with it the idea of ruling, dominion, and authority. That's been given to you this morning. Yeah. Wow. Glory to God. It is the gift of righteousness and the gift of grace. You can't reign without these two. You are not becoming righteous. You already are. Amen. In him you are righteous. Right. It is the righteousness of Christ that gives you the ability to reign on this earth. Amen. It's not by our own righteousness, right? That would mean that would be our old self-nature, reigning and ruling. Because our righteousness is as filthy rags. We were born sinners. We inherited that. But now we're born again, and we've inherited a new nature. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. To rule and reign here and now. I hope this is getting through to somebody. It's a gift. It belongs to us. He's given it to us. God wants us to act like we're righteous. He wants us to act like we're redeemed and set apart. Amen? Glory to God. Too many walk around saying, I'm so unworthy. Oh, I'm just a sinner. I'll never, you know... I'll never overcome this. No, you are the righteousness of God. Amen. Hallelujah. We've got to shake it off, rise, it, rise above it, and realize who we are in Him. Glory to God. Let's go to Genesis 126. 126. Then God said, let us make man in our image, according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky, over the cattle, and over all the earth. And over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. The word rule there means to reign. It speaks of a foundation of power coming from a meaning to walk. That's the walk that we're supposed to have. A walk of authority, a walk of dominion. That's how God created us. And the neat thing about it is he created us in his image. The word image means resemblance. We are made first. This is my 
this is my uh, observance, if, the, if this is in order, we, are, we were first created in spirit, in his likeness, after the likeness of God. God was spirit. Because if you go over to chapter 2, in verse six, 7, he says, Then the Lord God formed man out of the dust from the ground. Well, he had already created him. So first he was spirit. So God is wanting us to, to line up, to resemble who he is spiritually, not carnally, not in the old sinful nature, but who we are in the new nature, amen? Yeah. To have dominion speaks of treading down or prevailing against, to overtake, to subjugate. Subjugate means to bring under domination, control, or subdue. Think about that. That's what you're created to do. You don't need the enemy uh, beating you up anymore. You don't need right. the thoughts Amen. tearing you down anymore. Right. Because you were created to have dominion over that. That's you got right. pain in your body, and I know all about pain. You have authority over that pain. You got sickness and disease. You have authority over that sickness and disease. Glory to God. Glory to God. We have been given the authority over the birds, the fish, the cattle, and over all the earth. Over all the earth. Hallelujah. First Corinthians six seventeen tells us that we are if we are united with him, we are one in spirit. If we are united with him, we are one in spirit. So again, that talks about likeness, resemblance. One with him. We are a supernatural people living in a natural state. But it's usually the other way around, unfortunately. That's what that seems to be the way we are. But I believe God is it wants to change that, you know, and He's looking for that that Josiah generation that will rise up, will seek God and, and stand on His word of promises for their lives. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ephesians two, if you want to go there. Another thing about our reigning is we've been given a seat of honor. Think about that. Ephesians 2, Amplified says, verse 5 and 6, Even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses, he made us alive together in fellowship, in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. For it is by grace, his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you are saved, delivered from judgment and made partakers of Christ's salvation. And he raised us up together. Yeah. Raised us up. There's that resurrection power. Because when you were crucified with Christ, you were also raised with Christ. And he made us sit down together, giving us joint seating. Amen? Yeah. Yeah. Joint seating. I just want to turn back. Joint seeing with him in the heavenly sphere by virtue of being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the Anointed One. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, limitless, surpassing riches of his free grace, his unmerited favor, and his kindness and goodness toward us in Christ Jesus. Raised us up together speaks of union. It speaks of an arousing from death. It's already been done. Your old man is dead. He's aroused you from death. And it also denotes resemblance. Again, if looking back at Genesis, we are made in the likeness and the resemblance of God. Therefore, if we are seated, if I was to put three chairs here and have God, Jesus, and myself, we are, we are together. We are in company with. Yes. We make decisions together. We get to, to take authority over things together. Because that has been given to us. That's our rightful place, is seated with him. Hallelujah. Amen. Made us sit down together means to give a seat in company. It means to appoint. It denotes union. So he has appointed you for that position. Many people, though, are not sitting there. We are seated in heavenly places in Christ. Heavenly speaks of power. It speaks of elevation. It speaks of happiness. To be seated with Christ is a position of not only reigning and ruling, but of rest and of victory. And many Christians need to come into a rest of knowing who they are. 
Um, I've taught on this in the past. Uh, the phrase in, if you, if you look up that word in the Greek, it speaks of a fixed position in Christ. You are in a fixed position. Nothing can move you. Amen. Christ has given that position to you, and it, it, it is in that area of that realm of authority that you are fixed in him. So don't let the devil or anyone else tell you that you have no power or you have no authority or dominion. Amen? Amen. We have to learn to rest in the victory he's given us over Satan, over sin, over death, and over um, everything that the enemy tries to play against us. It's already been done for us. Yes. You know you don't have to defeat the enemy. Many Christians think they've got to fight with the devil, and there is a time, don't get me wrong, there is a time of prayer, warfare, and all of that, you know, because I know I've been there. But you don't have to defeat him. He's already been defeated at the cross. Amen. He's under our feet. We don't have to, uh, you know, give him any authority. Because the Bible says in James 4, 7, Submit therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. The word resist means to stand against, to oppose. We have to oppose him with what? Truth. We can't fight him with natural weapons, but truth, the word of God, and even rhema truth, what, whatever God has spoken to you. If you journal, you know, if he's given you a promise, you know, remind the enemy that this is what God has said. You've got to stand on the promises of God. Just like uh, Jesus did in Matthew 4, what did he say to the devil when the devil was tempting him? Three it's times. Written. It is written. Amen. It is written. So that's what we have to do. You know, the Lord was, um, I won't go into a lot of detail about this, but the Lord had, um, has been really teaching me some things about authority. And it was quite funny because it never hit me till the other day uh, what he was showing me, you know, that in hindsight, if you look back. But <clears throat> um, I walk every day, and um, I went out for my walk one morning, and as I was leaving my house, which has never happened, I might have been a, almost attacked by a dog, but this particular morning, a bird, out of nowhere, started to attack me. It didn't hit me, but I'll tell you, that bird, it was swooping down, missed my head by a couple inches. You know, and here I am, I came to a, a dead standstill, and this bird, and I'm like this, and I'm swooping back and forth, and, you know, thinking, what are the neighbors thinking? Am I looking like an idiot? <laughs> At one point, I was almost on the ground because I didn't know where to go. And I thought, I, you know, do I run or what? And then all of a sudden, it was like the Lord said to me, use your authority. Yeah. I, and because I had just finished reading in, in Genesis 126, what has he given us dominion yeah. over? Amen. Every creeping thing. So I said, in the name of Jesus, I didn't yell it, but I said, you know, in the name of Jesus, get away from me, bird. And just like that, the bird flew away. Oh, wow. <laughs> so then, you know, and then, you know, as you know, as some of you know, uh, my dog went missing for three weeks. Uh, I won't get into all that, but anyway, um, that was a whole thing he dealt with me, with my heart, and towards my dog, because I didn't really like her personality. And, you know, so, but anyway, <laughs> but I love her. I love her. She's a good dog. But I got really frustrated because I was the only one who saw the dog. Every time we'd find her, she, she was running in the perimeters of uh, Mapleton, um, Gladstone, Belmont, and, and so forth. So she, for three weeks, that's a long time without food and water. And I saw her three times. And every time I'd get out of the car and I'd say, come on, Tonto, come on, I got a cookie for you. That dog would look at me and she would just shoot off into the woods. She didn't want nothing to do with me. And you know, of course, I felt guilty. Because maybe she knew I didn't really like her. I don't know. I ended up, the last day that we caught her, um, she was seen up in Mapleton. And so Rob had backpacked out there with all his stuff, and, and he spent hours out there looking for her. Well, no sooner did I get a call saying that she was up Avon Road. So I drove up there, saw her. She's a big shepherd, big 100-pound shepherd. So she's trucking down the middle of the road, skinny as anything. And coming towards me, so once again, I get out of the car, come on, Tonta, get in the back seat. And she just shot off out through the woods. Well, at this point, I was really, like, that was it for me. So I came home, and but before I went home, I drove around looking for her, thinking she would leave the woods and maybe go somewhere else. And I started to um, petition God. I mean, I prayed, you know, because she was lost and so forth, but something kicked into me, and I started just... On, on uh, Glanworth Drive and up Old Victoria Road, I started crying. And I said, God, 
I am petitioning you right now. Show me how to pray for this dog to get home. And you know, I had repented and did what I needed to do about the ill feelings I had towards her. And, and you know, I thought that was all taken care of. But all of a sudden, I heard the Lord say to me, use your authority and bind the enemy. Well, it was like a light went on. So I started to go down Old Victoria Road and I started binding the enemy, any weapon that was formed against Tonza, and I came against fear and everything. Well, no sooner did I get in the house, the phone rang, and it was a lady in Kettle Creek that lives behind us. She says, I see your dog walking up the, up the rows of trees. So, you know, I get in my car and I said, that's it, I'm getting her today. So I jumped out of the car and I started chasing her with a cracker and peanut butter <laughs> down this field and I'm yelling at her. Well, literally she stopped, she turned and looked at me and then she ran. She ran right into Kettle Creek where all the houses were. Up the sidewalk and people are out on their driveways and so forth. And in turn, long story short, I, I sped up beside her and I rolled my window down and we're both going the same distance. And I looked at her, I said, Tonza, in the name of Jesus, you stop right now. She looked at me, she crossed the road, went over on the other side, started heading up this other road that I knew she was going to end up in the woods. Again, I pulled up, did the same thing. She came to a, a dead stop, turned around and got in. She couldn't get in the car quick enough. She was crawling all over me and, and, you know. But all that to say that, you know, the Lord was showing me the authority that, that, that I had over over the earth, over the living things. And I had not in those three weeks, I wished I maybe would have used it, but you know, I knew it up in here and in my heart. But anyway, you know, so we need to use our authority. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So she's home safe and sound anyway. Okay, I got So because we're in him, we are also there with him. Yeah. Amen? True. Because we're in a fixed position with him. We are there with him, and wherever he goes, we go. So it's in this heavenly place, the place of power and authority. It's given in us all riches that pertain to life and godliness. Ephesians 1.13 says, 1.3, sorry, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places. And then we read in 1 Peter, it tells us that we are a chosen generation, a royal generation, a priesthood, a holy priesthood. That's the people of God that we are. 1 Peter 2 says that. But you are not like that, for you have been chosen by God himself. You are priests of the king, you are holy, you are pure, you are God's very own. Amen. All this so that you may show to others how God called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were less than nothing, now you are God's own. Once you knew very little of God's kindness, now you are... Now your very lives have been changed by him. We belong to him. We are royal, we are chosen, and we are holy. And we reign by walking in the new man. And I'm just going to close with um, going to Ephesians, or sorry, Colossians 3. I love the book of Ephesians and Colossians <coughs> because I'll tell you, those two books, you want to know how to walk, and those are the books you study. I lose all track of time up here. Unfortunately, I should have. So I don't know how long I've been. But just give me a few more minutes here. Colossians 3 says, Therefore, if you have been raised up with Christ, keep seeking the things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on the things above, not on the things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ. I want to stop there. You have died and your life is hid with Christ. That word hid there... It means concealed. You are concealed in Christ. It also means that it may not become known. Your life, your old sinful nature is hid in Christ. And that it may not become known. Because Christ, the new nature, needs to arise out of us. Amen? And it's something that just doesn't happen. We have to put it on. You know, this is something I love to teach because it says in verse 10, and having put on the new self, which is renewed, being renewed in true knowledge. Again, it's a knowledge problem we have. The reason people don't walk in the new man is because they have not renewed their mind. They've not gotten rid of the stinking thinking. Ephesians 4.24, and put on the new self, the new nature which is created in the likeness of God in true righteousness and true holiness. Amen? 
Romans 12, 2, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living sacrifice. Holy. A holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. God wants to show you what his will is. He wants to show you the purpose he has for you. And I'm not talking ministry. I'm not saying that that wouldn't be part of it. But I'm talking about he wants to show you what his will is for, for you in the new nature. Yes. Overcoming. Amen. Because before you can really, you know, maybe get up here, you've got to work out some things. You know, there's got to be some working out. Hallelujah. To prove the will of God, we must have a renewed mind. The transformed mind will allow the scales of deception to fall away and will allow us to see what the will of God is for our lives and that we rule and reign here and now. Not in the sweet by and by, but here and now. Yeah. You know, I can, um, I'm going to close, but I can have an altar call, but I don't think that that would really help because this is something, you know, I can pray for people's minds to be renewed, but that's something you've got to do. It's something that you've got to pull up your bootstraps and say, you know what, I'm going to get into this word and I'm going to, I'm going to see what it says about me and who I am in him. Because God wants a people. He wants a Josiah generation that are going to bring forth the kingdom of God here and now in power, in righteousness and holiness. And I know just by what he's been dealing with me, you know, the, the idols have got to come down. The compromising and the complacency is prevalent in the church today. And that's what he wants to deal with. He's waiting for us to deal with it. We have to stop relying on the preachers. Yes. Come to church. Come to me. I'm not saying don't do that because we need teachers. We need prophets. We need evangelists, pastors. But don't rely on them every Sunday to get your fix. Yeah, every sure. Wednesday or cell meetings or whatever the case may be. Get in the Word. Amen. Dissect it. The Bible says in Timoth 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved. Amen. Unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of truth. Amen. That means to dissect this Word. Dissect it because you're the one that you've got to stand before God. Amen? Amen. So let us make that heartfelt decision today. You know, don't walk away from here. I pray that you, you know, your heart would receive um, what I said and would, you would bring change into your lives. Yes. Father, I just thank you for today, this opportunity, God. I thank you that you are an awesome God. <laughs> there is no one greater than you. I thank you that you love us unconditionally. That there's no sin that is greater than, than what you have for us and what you want to do for us, Lord. That never stops you from moving in our lives. So, Father, I pray right now for all my brothers and sisters here, Lord, that, Father, if there's some that need a fresh touch from you this morning, that you would just breathe upon them uh, before the day is over, Lord. That you would just resurrect, Lord, in their hearts that fire, those embers, oh God. That you would stir up the relationship with them, Lord, intimacy. Hallelujah. I just thank you, Lord, for this time, and I just pray blessing upon each one. In Jesus' mighty name. So we're going to break.